and I'm really happy to introduce to you Dr. Sheila Tevez. Uh, Dr. Tevez is an assistant professor at the University of British Columbia. She did her PhD work in Steve Henikoff's lab at the Fred Hutch here in Seattle. She, as a grad student, she was an NSF fellow and she won the prestigious Weintraub Graduate Student Award for her PhD work where she made many important discoveries in chromatin and transcription ranging from DNA supercoiling's role in nucleosome stability and heat shock and how it impacts uh, stalled polymerase and nucleosome turnover. Then she went on as a post uh, Jane Coffin's child postdoctoral fellow in Bob Tejan's lab, and she used really cool single particle tracking and high-res uh, imaging to show how um, mitotic chromosomes are bookmarked and allow for transcriptional memory. So I'm really excited to hear what her own lab has been doing to uncover new mechanisms of transcriptional memory. And with that, I will leave the floor to Dr. Tevis. Thank you so much for that uh, very generous introduction and for the invitation. Um, I Can everybody see the slides? Like, is it show, showing now? We can see them. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm really, um, it's been such a difficult time these last couple months, but um, I've been really lucky to enjoy uh, this seminar series. So I'd like to thank all the organizers for their work, uh, their hard work in getting all this together. Um, and yeah, I've, I'm a little actually intimidated uh, being here given the caliber of the previous speakers, um, but I'm really excited to talk to you guys about our work. Um, for those who are curious, this background here is the um, Panorama Ridge overlooking Garibaldi Lake right above, uh, right near um, Whistler area about an hour and a half north of um, Vancouver. So it's a beautiful area for mountains and obviously systems. Um, I also want to give uh, a shout out to my family. Um, <laughs> some of them are joining here. Um, I, most of you won't know, but I'm, I'm a Filipino immigrant and a first gen PhD. And my family has always been super supportive and when they found out that they could actually tune in and watch me give a talk, um, they got really excited, even though I warned them of the content. So, uh, hello family. Um, hopefully um, it'll be okay, even if it sounds like I'm talking gibberish. Okay, so anyway, with that, um, I'll get started. Um, since I can't claim the fame that some of our previous speakers have, I thought maybe I'd just tell you guys a bit how I got here. Um, so after I finished uh, college, um, a small liberal arts college majoring in biochemistry, um, I didn't really know what to do with my life. And I thought as many Asian kids, maybe I could go to medical school, um, but I knew I wasn't gonna be competitive to get into medical school. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll work in a lab first. So I tried and applied and got accepted at the National Institutes of Health. And here for a few years, I did lab work. Um, and if there was ever any doubt whether I would be good at medical school, uh, at the very least, I realized how much I really liked research. Um, and that's when I decided to move across the country and start grad school at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where I did my graduate work with Steve Hennikoff at the Fred Hutch. I liked grad school so much that I decided to do it all over again uh, with a postdoc uh, in Bob Tejan's lab at the University of California in Berkeley. And um, yeah, towards the end of my postdoc, I got really lucky to land a job at the University of British Columbia. Here's an aerial view of uh, the UBC campus, um, which is uh, surrounded by water. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a bunch of people here that are crazy 
and brave enough to join me in starting a brand new lab. And here specifically are these folks who not only signed up to do research, but uh, to work and start a brand new lab together. So um, with that, uh, I'll get into the research that we've been doing. Um, so family, just a heads up, this is when I start talking gibberish. Okay, so our work is really centered on um, transcription regulation. I've always been fascinated with the fact that we all start from a single cell, the zygote, which then develops into a fetus and then to a highly functioning adult, hopefully. But what this means is that despite all the different cell types in our body, almost all of them share the same genome. And what really makes all these different cell types is how different genes are regulated at different times. And in our lab, we study transcription regulation using mouse embryonic stem cells. Mouse embryonic stem cells have the capability to self-maintain indefinitely, meaning they maintain their identity over time, but they also have the capacity to differentiate into all cell types of the body, or almost all cell types of the body. And this differentiation capacity also allows for studying differences in gene regulation. And so our lab has really been interested in looking at different aspects of transcription regulation. Uh, one, the transcriptional memory, which is the ability to maintain transcription programs over time. Two, transcriptional plasticity, which is the ability to change transcription programs over time. Three, uh, the mechanisms of transcription, what I like to call nuts and bolts. And lastly, we're also interested, harking back in my graduate years, uh, on the relationship of chromatin dynamics with transcription regulation. How do we study transcription regulation? Um, in addition to standard molecular biology techniques, we really rely on two uh, major technologies. One is genomics, which allows us to get large-scale genome-wide data on a lot of these processes. And the second is microscopy, where we can really visualize uh, the temporal dynamics of the processes that we're studying. And we be, with these two um, different but complementary uh, approaches, you can really gain a lot of insight on gene regulation. Okay, so I thought today I'd tell you guys um, two uh, stories that are developing in my lab. Uh, the first is based on transcriptional memory and some published work. And uh, in the latter half, I'd like to talk about some of the newest stuff that we're doing in the lab, looking at the mechanisms of transcription. And as Christine mentioned, um, I'd like to take a break and open it up for questions after I finish the first part, uh, and then again after I finish this. Okay, so on to transcriptional memory. Most people don't realize that the cell cycle is actually highly disruptive to transcription. So as cells, uh, as cells enter S phase, you have DNA replication that is um, mutually exclusive to transcription. And then as cells divide into the M phase, we have massive changes in uh, the cellular landscape. And you can see some of it here in this movie. So first, you have a global down regulation of transcription. And Secondly, we have this massive condensation of mitotic chromosomes, as seen here in green. And then third, we have a global re reorganization of the nuclear environment because the, nucleus, uh, the nuclear membrane is uh, disassembled. And so really, the question that's driving this is how is transcript transcription maintained after mitosis? That is, after the cells divide, 
how do the new daughter cells know which genes to turn back on and which genes to keep silent? So, so one of the mechanisms that's been proposed for this type of transcription of memory has been termed mitotic transcription. And it really proposes a central role for transcription factors in this process. And as most of you are probably aware, transcription factors are DNA binding proteins that bind to specific sequences in the genome and have the ability to uh, either recruit or regulate the activity of the transcription machinery. And um, throughout the years, people have realized that the regions where they bind onto the genome are really highly accessible, as shown here by a measure of DNA hypersensitivity. Now, what's surprising is that even when chromosomes are highly condensed during mitosis, these highly accessible DNA binding regions remain accessible, suggesting that um, potentially these regions might be bookmarked uh, during mitosis to allow for efficient reactivation after mitosis. Now, uh, it was though a real conundrum when most transcription factors that were uh, observed were excluded from mitotic reasons. So you can see here, uh, one example that I'm showing here is just transcription factor YY1. Uh, shown in red, showing negative staining relative to DNA as seen by GAPI throughout the different stages of mitosis. And so many people throughout the years have observed this for most transcription factors. And so then there was this uh, conundrum, like how are these uh, DNA binding or these dysregulatory elements um, accessible, it remain accessible in mitosis when the transcription factors are excluded. And so it was then an advance when some of the first few uh, mito uh, some of the first few transcription factors were observed to bind to mitotic chromosomes. So for example, here's FOXA1 showing high enrichment, uh, high binding on mitotic chromosomes under live cell imaging. And so it people then hypothesize that there's a select group of transcription factors uh, that can bind mitotic chromosomes, bookmark uh, their target genes, and allow for transcription reactivation efficiently after mitosis. And so when I uh, got into this area, I thought maybe bookmarking might be used to maintain this, the ESL transcription program. And so I really focused on two specific questions. So how are ESL specific gene programs maintained? And second, the rest of the genes also have to be uh, reactivated after mitosis. And so how is the global transcription program maintained? So to focus on the first question, I specifically looked at transcription factors that are important for um, the ES cell state, namely SOX2, OP4, TAIL4, and NANO. So these transcription factors are important for binding uh, embryonic stem cell specific genes and allow for peripotency. And so then I asked, do these ES specific transcription factors act as mitotic bookmarkers? So I was biochemically trained in the Hancock lab. And so one of the first things I thought I should do is a biochemical fractionation. Basically, um, I did a biochemical fractionation to extract the chromatin bound fraction. And when I apply this, um, this technique to um, uh, synchronized mitotic cells, I can look at what's bound on mitotic chromosomes and what's not. And so here's, for example, uh, what it, this data would look like. So I, ran, I run the chromatin bound fraction in the Western lot and I, uh, I blot for SOX2. And I look at samples that are asynchronous, um, purified in mitosis, or purified in G2 or S phase. And I can see that SOX2 remains bound on mitotic chromosomes 
whereas pull two is really depleted uh, from my tide enzymes. And so here was my first indication that at least maybe SOX2 is um, potentially acting as a mitotic bookmarker. And so then I wanted to visualize SOX2 on mitotic chromosomes. Now, uh, I was, became really disappointed when the first thing that I did was to do fixed immunofluorescence and realized that SOX2 uh, by this method is gone from mitotic chromosomes. And I thought, well, how can that be when uh, biochemical data is saying otherwise? Well, we tried a few other things, including endogenously tagging the SOX2 uh, in our ESLs and visualize things under live condition. And then lo and behold, we have this beautiful enrichment of SOX2 on mitotic chromosomes. So what the heck's going on? Um, well, we realized that uh, it could be um, fixation. And so what I did here was look at live cells and basically make a movie um, as I add formaldehyde in. And so at 10 seconds into this movie, I'll add formaldehyde. And you can see that really quickly, within 30 seconds, you see this massive um, uh, eviction of SOX2 from mitotic chromosomes. And so this really got us thinking that it is um, a fixation that's causing this exclusion. And it's a little problematic because uh, throughout the decades, the evidence for transcription factor exclusion during mitosis was really um, born out of experiments using immunofluorescence. Um, now, I should note that there are some there have been some indications of this in the literature. So, for example, um, around the same time that our paper came out, uh, uh, Lerner et al. also um, saw this phenomenon for HNF1 beta. So, here under live conditions, you see um, HNF1 uh, binding to mitotic chromosomes, but after fixation, you see it excluded. And then the same back in 2003 was shown by uh, HMG proteins. But it was um, kind of obscure and not really clear how widespread this was. Um, and so we thought maybe, uh, you know, we could ask the question, is this unique to a few transcription factors? And so the way we wanted to answer this question was to quantify this um, enrichment on mitotic and the way we did this is by looking at the chromosome intensity of our transcription factor as marked by our HDBGFP signal, and then divided by the whole cell um, intensity, and then take the log to of that. And this it means that anything above uh, zero is enrichment on mitotic chromosomes, whereas uh, anything below zero is exclusion from uh, chromosomes. And so what you can see here is under live condition, it's highly enriched. And then upon fixation, you see this exclusion. And so we went ahead and tested a bunch of different transcription factors. And here I'm just showing you a few of them. But um, what we see is this consistent pattern of enrichment on mitotic chromosomes under live condition, but exclusion after fixation. And in fact, um, shortly after our, our paper got published, um, another group did a, uh, a thorough examination of over 500 transcription factors, showing that there's a wide range of uh, mitotic binding capacity among a large group of transcription factors. So here on the x-axis are the 500 uh, transcription factors, and on the y-axis is the mitotic bound fraction, again, a quantification of how well they are bound, or how well the signal is relative to the rest of the cell. And what you can see is that the vast majority of the transcription factors have um, intermediate or highly enriched um, binding to mitotic chromosomes. And so this really uh, led us to uh, conclude that SOX2 and many other transcription factors interact with mitotic chromosomes in contrast to um, 
decades of literature. And so next we wanted to ask, how does SOX2 interact with mitotochromes? And like, what is the dynamics of this interaction? In particular, I wanted to ask what, how much of SOX2 is binding versus unbound? And what is the dynamics of the binding? Basically, how long does it bind to mitotic chromosomes? And to do this, I really relied on single molecule live cell imaging. Um, in particular, we looked at uh, two different modes of single molecule imaging. And here, what this really allows is visualizing individual molecules as diffraction limited spots, and then allowing us through time lapse imaging, allowing us to track their movements over time. Um, in fast tracking mode, uh, we can look at the diffusion of these um, 3D diffusion of these molecules, and we can quantify whether they're bound or they're freely diffusing. And we can also assign diffusion constants to these. We can then slow down the acquisition rate and really focus on the um, bound population. And then we can look at how long these proteins are binding to DNA at any given time. And I would just really like to advertise that this work, um, I got a lot of help from the Tijin Laboratory on learning microscopy um, and single molecule imaging. Um, but a lot of this work on single molecule imaging uh, was in collaboration with Anders Hansen, who now has his own lab at MIT. He's also a great speaker, so check out his, um, his own lab. Hopefully, we'll hear more from his group soon. Okay, so uh, using these techniques, I wanted to ask how long does SOX2 bind to chromatin versus mitotic chromosomes? And for this, I'm just going to show you uh, how it looks for slow tracking. So to give you guys a little bit more detail on slow tracking, basically how it works is that we keep the camera open and any molecule that's moving faster than the camera rate is gonna look like a blurred image. Kind of like if you move your hand when someone is taking a picture of you. And in this way, only the ones that are bound, that are staying put in one location, uh, is seen as these diffraction limited spots. And then, as we can then measure the length of time a molecule binds to DNA by just um, correlating it with how long we can detect it in the single spot. And so here I'm showing you um, a representation of how we can um, visualize this binding time. So uh, on the x-axis here, or on the y-axis, I'm showing you the fraction of the bound population uh, as uh, we um, image them over time. And you can see 100% of the population is bound, and then over time, this decreases. And this decay rate is relative to the binding uh, dynamics of the transcription. And what you can see here, hopefully, is that in interface, you have this kind of characteristic curve. But in um, mitosis, you have a much uh, steeper decline in this decay curve, suggesting that transcription factor, this transcription factor, is binding much more dynamically in mitosis. And in fact, we can quantify the residence, the average residence time that SOX2, for example, binds to uh, chromatin and interface versus in my mitosis. And you can see that the length of time a transcription factor remains bound uh, is decreased by half. So this really tells us that SOX2 interaction with mitotic chromosomes is more dynamic than an in interface. And so then we asked, what causes this increase in dynamics? Well, we really thought that there could be two different, um, potentially different um, mechanisms. Well, one would be that chromatin is condensed, and so the binding sites become less accessible. And secondly, the transcriptional machinery is largely uh, downregulated in mitosis, and perhaps it's no longer uh, allowing for the protein-protein interactions that would stabilize um, SOX2 binding uh, under normal conditions. And I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna tell you the punchline 
that it's actually not chromatin condensation, but rather it's the transcriptional inactivation. So I'm going to show you what evidence we have on the chromatin condensation. So we measured um, accessibility of chromatin in a synchronous interface population or in a purified mitotic population and really found no difference in how accessible chromatin is. So here's a region that just shows um, fairly um, equal uh, accessibility. And in fact, when we focus on um, a SOX2 bound region, uh, shown here in this, the distal enhancer of the OCK4 gene, we can see really similar um, levels of accessibility. And so we realized from this that SOX2 DNA binding sites remain accessible during mitosis. And so it's not actually the condensation of chromatin that is causing the increase in the dynamics of SOX2. And in fact, um, I don't have the data, I don't have the time to show you right now the data, but it's really largely due to transcriptional silencing. And the model for that is that when you don't have transcription, you don't have the protein-protein interaction that would normally stabilize SOX2 binding on CDN. Okay, um, so uh, that's a little bit on how ESL specific gene transcription factors are working, but how about the global transcriptional reactivation? Um, for that, I really focused on um, the, uh, the promoter region. So as, um, as most of you might be aware, um, we have transcription requires the interaction between uh, transcription factors at the enhancer region and the pre-initiation complex or the RNA polymerase 2 machinery bound at the promoters. And so I really wanted to look at the, uh, this transcriptional machinery. And for a uh, historical reason, I focused on TBP as a candidate book. When we endogenously tag TBP and visualized it under live cell imaging, you can see that it's enriched on mitotic chromosomes as cells divide. And so then uh, I wanted to ask how does TBP interact with mitotic chromosomes? And again, I relied on single molecule imaging to characterize the interactions of TBP, where I found that uh, a small fraction of TBP remains uh, associated in binding to mitotic chromosomes, and that this binding, unlike SOX2, remains stable. Um, so here is the average residence time for TBP in interface, and note the, that this is about on the order of minutes in contrast to SOX2, which is on the order of seconds. And in mitosis, it really stays um, stably bound. And so we then asked, where does TBP bind in mitosis? And um, what we see is that it's, uh, so this is TBP chip seek in blue uh, in asynchronous populations and in red in um, mitosis. And what you see is that it's really staying uh, bound at the promoter regions. And so, Next, we asked, what are the effects of such stable TBP binding? Um, sorry, my, my slides are a bit out of, out of um, uh, order here, but to, to look at, uh, to examine how, um, what are the effects of TBP stable binding on mitotic chromosomes, I endogenously knocked in the oxygen-inducible degron to TBP such that upon the addition of auxin, uh, TBP is rapidly ubiquitinated and degraded. And you can see this um, in our um, homozygous knock-in. After addition of uh, auxin in six hours, it's mostly gone. It's not over 90% depletion. Whereas the wild type shows no effect uh, upon addition of auxin. And so I wanted to look at uh, what is the effect of this um, TBP degradation on reactivation of transcription. And so I collected cells in asynchronous population and in mitotic cells, but then I also collected cells upon 
exit out of mitosis, including uh, 30 minutes after um, release and 60 minutes after release, where they have mostly gone into uh, telophase. And then I looked at um, the chromatin-associated RNA, which is enriched for newly transcribed RNA. And so here I'm showing you just what the data looks like um, on a locus here at GAMTH, where in a synchronous population, you see high levels of transcription, as you would expect for a, a very active gene. Um, upon mitosis, you see this uh, global down regulation. And 30 minutes after release, you still see don't you still don't see very much effect, but upon 60 minutes, you see now starting to come back up um, after uh, cells start to reactivate transcription. And you can see this globally here with the sense uh, strand and the anti-sense signal plotted in a global average centered at the transcription cell site. So for the asynchronous population, you see uh, high levels of transcription in mitosis, you see global down regulation that is then reactivated 60 minutes after release. So then I asked what happens uh, when we degrade TDP? Well, um, the real effect is shown here. So in 60 minutes after um, mitosis, you have this um, decrease in the reactivation of transcription. Uh, after mitosis. So this is really where the effect is taking place. So this to us suggests that TBP is required for reactivation of transcription as cells exit mitosis. And perhaps this is not so surprising given that TBP is an essential uh, general transcription factor. Um, and so with that, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that work from um, two undergrads that have helped me in these uh, transcriptional memory studies. And that in my own group, a postdoc, Matt Merrick Batzinski, and a new grad student, Rachel Price, is following up on these um, studies, uh, looking at how transcription uh, is reactivated and what are the determinants of um, the transcription factors uh, binding to mitotic enzymes. And so with that, before I move into the next part of the talk, um, maybe I'd like to go ahead and get started with uh, the question and answer section. Thank you, Sheila. That was a terrific first part of the talk. So we have already uh, several questions. Uh, for example, uh, Jay Divakar asks, hi, how does fixation affect SOX2 on non-mitotic chromosomes? That is a really good question. And it is something that we've thought about how to do, but we cannot figure out how to do it. Um, the reason we can really see it clearly on mitosis is because you have this mitotic chromosome lined up at the metaphase plate, and that if it's excluded, it's just everything else outside of, um, it's just cytoplasmic signal. The difficulty in interface is that the SOX2 and the other transcription factors are still bound within the nuclear uh, membrane. And so when you fix it, it still just looks like um, nuclear, um, nuclear signal. And so we can't really tell um, how much uh, we're losing of this uh, binding um, in interface. And we've, we've thought about how to do it. Uh, we haven't really come up with uh, a good way. Um, and so if other people have a good way of uh, trying this out, please feel free. I'm really curious. Thank you very much. So let us try to ask um, one question from the audience. If we allow to talk, Shayazi uh, Mukherjee now. Can, can you talk? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Dr. Tevez, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering about the relationship between SOX2 being associated with the mitotic chromosomes and regulation of its uh, target genes. Do you think it regulates different subsets of target genes based on whether it's associated with 
uh, the mitotic chromosomes or not? Uh, that's a really good question. And that's something that we would really like to examine. Um, we haven't, we don't have the data for that, but um, other people have looked at other uh, transcription factors, mitotic bookmarkers uh, and ESLs. Uh, for instance, work by Pablo Navarro on ESRB suggests that um, only a subset of ESRB's target genes are bound during mitosis. And what's the relationship with that as cells exit out of mitosis is really curious. Um, there are a few other uh, labs, including um, David Sutter's lab, looking at SAX2 and OC4. Um, and so there are some indications that, that um, uh, these transcription factors are only binding a subset of their target genes in mitosis. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. So the next question we ask from the Q&A thread. So we have a question from Alison Swain, who says, very cool story. It seems like there might be two classes of SOX2 in cells, a set of dynamic SOX2 and another set of more stably binding SOX2. Do you have any ideas what might dictate whether SOX2 binds in a dynamic versus stable fashion to chromatin? Ah, that is a really good question. And I think it's really inherent on, so I should say that DNA binding is really um, critical, obviously for um, the DNA binding domain of SAX2 is really critical for the stable and dynamic binding. If you, if you don't have the DNA binding domain, then SAX2 doesn't bind to DNA, as you might expect. Um, but what is interesting is that the other part of SAX2, which is the transactivation domain, which is normally um, important for protein-protein interaction, when you remove that, you now have primarily just the dynamic binding. And to me, this really suggests that the stable binding is uh, mediated by the protein-protein interaction um, with other transcription factors, perhaps, um, as SOX2 has been shown to complex with, um, for example, OX4 and ANOG, uh, but also perhaps with cofactors and maybe even the transcriptional machinery stabilizing its binding to DNA. So I really do think that the, it, it's mediated by protein-protein interactions. Great, thank you very much. Now, the last question for this first part of the QA from Beth Moorfield, uh, who asks, yeah. have you looked at TBP dynamics at POL1 or POL3 transcribed genes? Ah, so that is a really good question. So um, TBP, um, as you hint, is required for all three RNA chromosomes. The dynamics that we see, though, um, is uh, locus non-specific. So basically, we are blind to what sequence of the DNA TBP is binding to when we're, when we're seeing the dynamics um, under live conditions. So um, it's totally possible that some of the, that some or a lot of the binding that we see is mediated um, by pull one or pull three transcription. That we can't know by imaging. Um, so we try to look at it uh, by genomics. But maybe I'll go through some of that more in the second part of it. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this fantastic talk. And uh, there is a small group of, of trainees who will uh, have a chance to talk to you later after this talk. And for all other attendees, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you again, Sheila. Thank you all. Thank you so much for this opportunity again.